This is a video introduction to redox titrations. This includes material from chapter 15 of your analytical chemistry textbook. When we do redox titrations, these are titrations where we take advantage of a redox reaction to tell us something about one of the species involved in the reaction. Uh, in general, we need to learn about some terminology first before we can start predicting the shape of a redox titration curve. So, uh, in a redox reaction, we have a species, two species, one of which is in its oxidized form and becomes reduced over the course of reaction, the other one which does the opposite. When something is oxidized, it loses electrons, and when something is reduced, it gains electrons. We have the somewhat confusing terminology that the oxidizing agent is the thing that gets reduced. It allows the other species to be oxidized, and vice versa for the reducing agent. A much better way to think about this is to count oxidation numbers, which you should have a background in from general chemistry. If the oxidation number goes up, that species is oxidized. If the oxidation number goes down, that species is reduced. To figure out the predictable stoichiometry that we need to make a titration curve, we need to know how to balance the redox reactions so that we can figure out the correct mole ratios and the number of electrons involved. The easiest way to do this is with the half reaction method. First, we need to identify, based on oxidation numbers, which species is being oxidized and which one is being reduced. We then split up the overall reaction into the anodic and cathodic reactions. We balance atoms other than H and O, just using general mass balance uh, criteria. We balance oxygen next by adding water to the side that needs it. We do this for each half reaction. And we balance hydrogen by adding protons to the side that needs hydrogen. So now the, each half reaction should be balanced with, with respect to mass. For a redox reaction, we also have to worry about balancing with respect to charge. And so we add electrons to the side that needs them in order to have the charges be the same on each side of the half reaction. They don't necessarily need to be zero, but they need to be the same. Since we can't create or destroy electrons over the course of a redox reaction, before we add the two half reactions back together, we need to account for the fact that there are different numbers of electrons on each side. In other words, when we add the equations back together, we want the electrons to cancel. So we need to balance the number of electrons between the two half reactions by multiplying each one uh, by the correct factor. Then we add the half reactions together and cancel any species occurring on both sides, including, ideally, the electrons. If the electrons don't cancel, you've done something wrong. I should note that the uh, balancing hydrogen and balancing oxygen by adding protons and water, this only applies in acidic solutions. For this class, we're going to assume that everything happens in acidic solution. This is a pretty common assumption when you do redox titrations. Most of the ones you're going to do will happen in acidic solution. A redox titration is a kind of electrochemical cell, which is a cell that uses a redox reaction to perform work. And there are two classes of electrochemical cells. The difference is whether uh, the reactions are spontaneous or not. The half reactions can be combined to individual half cells to make a traditional electrochemical cell diagram, or they can happen in the same beaker, which is what we're going to do when we do redox titrations. When they're in different beakers, we can have each half reaction happening in its own cell. For the, so for this example of iron and cerium reacting in a redox reaction, we have uh, the reduction on one side and we have the oxidation on the other side. In each case we need an electrode for electricity for electrons to be able to flow through this system. Uh, and so the, you can either make the electrode out of one of the metals. In this case we don't have solid metal as a participant in either of these half reactions. So we can make the electrodes out of something inert like platinum that doesn't participate. These are connected by a wire, and the wire has in it a potentiometer, or a voltmeter, which measures voltage. And then in order for current to flow through this system, we need another connection. We need to make a loop for current to flow through. Uh, and so the electrons are going to flow this way um, from the anode to the cathode. The final step in completing the circuit is to put in a salt bridge to allow the movement of charge uh, from right to left as well as from left to right so that we can make an electrical circuit. So the oxidation half reaction produces electrons. Those electrons then go to the cathode 
where they're used in the reduction reaction. The cell notation for this cell looks like this. And so you have the electrode material, a vertical line. Uh, well, you have the anode material specifically, a vertical line. The half reaction that occurs at the anode. Then a double vertical line for the salt bridge. And then all the other stuff for the cathode. The potentiometer is there to measure the difference in potential between the two platinum electrodes. And what this tells you is the reduction potentials, the relative difference between the reduction potentials of the two half reactions. Standard reduction potentials, which you can look up in a table, are measured relative to the standard hydrogen electrode, which is set to have a reduction potential of zero by definition. The total electrochemical cell potential, E cell, is based on the difference of these reduction potentials. And it's always reduction potential of the cathode half reaction minus the reduction potential of the anode half reaction. So for the example that we've used in this uh, situation here, the standard reduction potentials are there. Uh, cerium is reduced in this reaction. Iron is oxidized, and its half reaction is, is backwards there. It's written as a reduction. And so the E cell is the cathode, the reduction half reaction, minus the anode, the oxidation half reaction. And so we get an E cell of 0.93 volts. These values tell us essentially what's going to happen. A more positive E reduction potential means that that species is a stronger oxidizing agent and vice versa. A little bit of math that can be done with this redox reactions uh, is to use this equation called the Nernst equation to figure out a potential for an act a redox reaction. So this is the simplified form of the um, Nernst equation, and there's a more complicated derivation where you get to this from equations involving Gibbs free energy and the equilibrium constant. Suffice it to say that this equation relates the E, the standard reduction potential, uh, to the number of electrons that are moved around, which is n, and the concentrations and stoichiometry of the reduced and oxidized species in the half reaction. So, once we know the Nernst equation, once we know how the cell looks, we can figure out the shape of a redox titration curve. So, this is a slight modification of the previous cell diagram that we saw, because now, our titration beaker is going to be the one on the right, where we have our half reaction of interest, in this case cerium, and we're going to add the iron titrant to it to initiate the redox reaction. On the other side of the electrochemical cell is our reference electrode. In this case, it's the standard hydrogen electrode. We can use the Nernst equation for the half reaction of interest to predict the potential that we're going to see. And for any given amount of titrant, that Nernst equation is going to change because concentrations will change. And so as we add more and more titrant, we can calculate the potential and build the shape of our titration curve, which in this case will be potential versus titrant added instead of something like uh, pH or like uh, P magnesium that we saw earlier. So an example of a problem that you could do, and we'll do this in class, is to titrate 30 mils of 0.1 molar cerium 4 plus in HCl with 0.3 molar iron 2 plus in HCl. And the reason that we use HCl is to present the precipitation of metal hydroxides which can form uh, when there's excess hydroxide ions in solution. So we have our balanced redox reaction. This is balanced with respect to mass and charge, so we don't have to do anything there. We have our two standard reduction potentials, which we saw earlier, and we have our cell notation. The E cell that we're going to use is the cathode reduction potential minus the reduction potential for the standard hydrogen electrode, uh, which is zero. And so to find E, we're going to use the Nernst equation. So the things that we need to worry about, well, we know that there's a mole of electrons transferred back and forth, so we've got N. And then at any given amount of titrant that we add, we need to calculate what is the concentration of the reduced form of, in this case, cerium, and what is the concentration of the oxidized form. We have the standard reduction potential already, and so knowing all of those things, we can calculate E, which is E cathode, in the equation to the left, and that will tell us E cell at any point in the titration.